instruct you in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, who by appointment is the Christ. I am Elder Marion King, and I am happy uh, to be here with you on this evening. Happy that you thought it not robbery to stop in and just uh, pull up to the table so we can see what the Lord is saying to us that we might be the better uh, for kingdom growth, the better for kingdom use, uh, better meat for his use. Come on, bow your heads with us. Dear kind and heavenly father, we thank you now. We give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. We thank you, God, for this day because it is the day that you have made. And so we are appreciative of the brand new mercies that have ushered us through the day. We are appreciative for the victories of the day. We are appreciative, oh God, that in spite of what uh, we are pressed with, in spite of what we are confronted with, that you have still sought to grant us success. And so we bless your name on tonight. We give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. Now, God, we invite you to come in the midst of us, Holy Ghost of God, sit with us, sup with us, teach us, uh, help us now that when we leave this place, our testimony will be, it was good for us to have been here. We give you all of the praise. We give you all of the glory. It is in the name of your precious son, Jesus, that we lift this prayer and everybody said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. We honor God, we bless God, certainly for uh, the shepherd uh, of this house, of this ministry in the person of Pastor Michelle C. Thomas and all that God has uh, called her to uh, in this season. We bless God for her journey. We bless God for what uh, he's already done along the way. We bless God for what he's doing right now, but we are waiting with baited anticipation for the thing that he yet said he will do on her behalf. So if you have been joining in prayer with us, continue to lift her, continue to lift the first family as they, um, master parts of the journey, but there are still parts that need to be done. There's still healing, much healing to come, but we bless God for the evidence of what he has done in the midst of us. Amen, somebody. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, listen, we have come together on tonight um, as we do on Wednesday nights to uh, pull up to the table and see uh, what else the Lord it's going to speak into us, whatever, what else he's going to reveal to us. We've been in the series, I survived it um, from the beginning of this month, October. And if you've been traveling along with us, you know that the first installment um, along the way was pressing your way to wholeness. Uh, and we talked about pressing and how it is. Pressing means to apply pressure um, so that we can get the full worth out of whatever it is that we are confronted with. And we realized that in um, this series, I Survived It, uh, we can't identify our it by somebody else's it. Everybody has one. My it may not be your it. Your it is not somebody else's it, but everybody has one. And we are uh, surviving daily um, as we go through, somebody say it, amen, amen, amen. And so then our second installment, we came back on the second Sunday and the woman of God preached, I'm broken to break out. And that was such an awesome, awesome word. Um, we looked at the fact that um, in our brokenness, God will allow us, and he will cause us to be broken that he can get the maximum worth, the maximum value out of us. And so as we go through this journey, uh, we are inviting God. It's not that we, um, it's the top of the list in terms of uh, how I feel about it, but because I know that God's gonna get the glory, then I invite him to take uh, my brokenness and to do 
whatever he needs to do with me in my brokenness that I can break out and I can be maximum use of God. And so that brings us up to uh, this past Sunday, uh, two days ago, and our third installment in this series, in the series of I Survived It, was the wisdom to survive. And listen, as I was sitting and, and contemplating uh, what the Lord was saying to me, because this is the personal journey. We come to the table uh, to gain revelation. We come to the table to gain understanding. We come to the table to grow. Um, but how many of us know that in the application of it, it is applied to our individual walk? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I know God is with me. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And so listen, uh, the wisdom to survive it, uh, Pastor Michelle backed that up with a little sub subject. And she said, I woke up to wake up. And so as I began to look at how those things are intertwined, watch this. Um, to exercise wisdom, one must be totally and consciously aware, which brings us to the concept of wokeness, if you will allow me. Um, you know how we, we make up words and uh, we, we, we're just going to plant that one right there. So it brings us to the concept of wokeness. But when I began to uh, look at that, because uh, we find ourselves telling people sometimes, stay woke now. And we're not talking about just waking up and drinking a cup of coffee, but we're talking about a state of mind. And so I wanted to get um, some information where, that you could write down um, with reference to this. And so I went to the Urban Dictionary. The Urban Dictionary defines woke as uh, being aware and knowing what's going on in the community. Amen? Let me say it again. The Urban Dictionary defines the term woke, in quotation, as um, being aware and knowing what's going on in your community. So um, I see some of us writing, and, and that's a fantastic thing. And so if you would just underline or highlight being aware, because that's going to be a theme um, as we go back to the scripture and see what Paul was saying to the church at Colosh. Then I went to uh, the Merrimack Webster Dictionary, and the Merrimack Webster Dictionary defines woke as being aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues. Let me say it again being aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues. And so as we began to look at um, what the Apostle Paul was doing, um, how he was um, pointing this narrative to the church at Colosh, we realized that um, there was some resemblance to his message to the church at Ephesus. But watch this. There is a distinct difference um, between his messages. There are some similarities, but when he talked to and he instructed the church at Ephesus, Paul's message centered around the church as the body of Christ. But when he ministered to, when he uh, sent his message to, uh, the church at Colosh, um, his message, watch this, was Christ as the head of the church and he warns them against trusting in worldly wisdom and he speaks clearly to the uh, mortification of all corruption or corrupt affections. And last thing, he instructs again on how they should live. Let me try that again. When Paul instructs the church at Colosh, his message had to be different than the message at, for the church at Ephesus. There were similarities, 
But when he ministered to the church at Collage, listen, he ministered based on this foundation that Christ is the head of the church. And there were some warnings in there. That's, that's the meat and the potatoes. And we're going to get to some of that tonight in verses 5 through 15. There were some warnings against trusting in worldly wisdom. And he took that opportunity to clearly, somebody say clearly, to clearly um, speak to the mortification of all corrupt affections. And then the last thing, he instructed them again, because this was a common theme throughout the churches, um, instructed them uh, concerning how they should live. Amen, somebody? And so as we begin to look at uh, where the word took us on Sunday, um, I was um, intrigued with how the Lord moved upon Pastor Michelle. Uh, because he had her uh, talk about ways in which we can tell that people are not woke. Can anybody remember or did anybody include in their notes something about um, some of the ways how we can tell people are not woke, quote, woke? One was when they rely on emotions. Is that one? <laughs> Okay. Um, if your cry out is louder about the government assistance than it is to God. You're not woke. You're not woke. You're not woke. If you still do not understand your purpose on this earth, then you are asleep. Uh -huh. And if you still can choose the knowledge of man over your relationship with God, you are asleep. Okay. okay. And if you're not progressing past the introductory message, then you are asleep. Okay. okay. And that, that introductory message, um, not seeking how to make um, a difference as we have come into the body of Christ, just um, going along with the surface information and being okay with that. Amen. Amen. And so when we talk about the state of being um, woke, what we want to make sure um, of as we pull information and pull revelation from the scripture is the exact same thing that Paul was talking to um, the people at Kolosh um, about. Can I, Deacon Bruce, do you have the scripture um, handy? I know you do. Um, chapter three, verses one through four. I just want to look at that um, initially and get, get that in people's hearing so that we can look at um, the revelation that's coming up out of there. Can I get a reader tonight? Is that you, Peyton? Yes, ma'am. Okay, <laughs> come on with it. One through four. Verses one through four. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, Set your sights on the reality, realities, realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Amen. Amen. And so that's an excellent prelude um, to the information that's forthcoming in verses um, 5 through 15. That's, that's a good introduction. It's a good warming up of the people to remind them of who they are and what has happened in their lives. And because of what has happened in their lives, um, who they are destined to be if they remember uh, a few things. Anybody want to go into their notes and talk to us about the information in verses one through four, something that stood up in your spirit as uh, the word was going forth on Sunday? Yeah. 
Praise God. Good evening, everyone. I thought it was uh, important that in very rudimentary is to be woke. The first thing you have to do is wake up. And we thank God for waking up every day. That means that we're still here. And if we're still here, we still got an opportunity for God to be God. And we just thank and praise him for the, the, the ability to still be here. And while we're still here, let's get busy on being woke and paying attention and knowing what's going on in the community of the kingdom of God. So I thought that it, the play on words was, was excellent, I thought, and, and, and very accurate as far as our struggle, because we've been studying about our struggle with the spirit and the flesh, and we have to stay woke every day and during every battle with the spirit and flesh. We got to be woke, pay, pay attention, and be knowledgeable about what's going on in that battle. Amen. So that Amen. Good. That's that's excellent, Deacon Bruce, because you're bringing back um, information from a previous study, um, how we talked about we don't get time off for good behavior um, on this journey, how it is that we must always be an active participant um, in this journey. We must always be alert. And so adding this word woke to this situation um, gives uh, more depth of meaning to it because when we look in uh, verse one, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. What are the realities of heaven? Somebody help us with that. Come on now, don't be shy. You know how we do. Well, we go beyond what we can physically see because that's man, that's human, that we are confined, that's a confinement. And we go beyond that and we know that the realities of heaven is that our ultimate place or our ultimate struggle, our ultimate goal is to be with God. So we do the things that the word tells us to do and we help to pull others to do the things that the word tells us to do so that we all can get to that place to be with God. Amen. Amen. Right there. Um, anybody else want to jump in right behind Dr. Deans? Good evening, Elder. Um, good evening, family. I'm good, thank you. Um, just in reflecting on the realities of heaven, I think that as you study, particularly from um, where we were in terms of understanding and, and getting wisdom, I think um, it's important to always understand that heaven is achievable and attainable, um, and it's a real place. And I think that this particular word, I think, was was trying to, not caution, but was trying to encourage us to consider, you know, in, in terms of our salvation, in terms of our growth, in terms of our walk. Um, in my mind, I, I, I interpret it as you always have to consider heaven and consider it as a goal. So heaven always being the goal in that, you know, you, you'll be welcomed home and, and because you've not just accepted Christ, but because it's a real, it's a real thing to attribute. And, and that it's just like God, like God is real. He's ever present. He's omnipresent. He's always there. And so heaven um, as a reality is that it is, it is actual and factual. And so if you set your, if you set a goal to achieve that, to attain that, to get to heaven, then that, then to me, it would logically follow that you will do the things on earth to, that require you to get there. And the things on earth that require you to get there are to be obedient, to study the word, to live right, to love um, your neighbor, to do all the things that God commands us to do. Um, so, so when you ask about the reality for me, the realities of heaven for me mean the fact that it is real, that it is attainable um, if I just do my part. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Janine. Anyone else want to jump in? And as we go through our things here on earth, we expect to have our it that was referenced. All of us have our its, but we should go through those it situations, pressing by using the word of God to get through them. Amen. 
Amen. Praise God. Are you coming in, Deacon Bruce? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, when you said the realities of heaven, something dropped in my spirit. It said, I have given you a procedures and a process. And we talked about the precepts of God and the precepts of God and the process that we have to encounter and the instructions. We, again, we've been learning about God is intentional and he's strategic in everything. He gives us the recipe for heaven. Heaven, he gives us the victory in heaven, but he's not going to make that overcome us. He, he gives us our own free will to accept it. And once we accept it, then he will he make sure we have the information available to, to access heaven, to access the victory. And, and, and God is the only thing that's fair in life. He said, ask and it shall be given. Knock and the door will be open. And seek and you will find. But if we don't do that, then we won't realize heaven. But the process is there. But we have to apply the energy and the effort to get there. And he is not a respecter of person that we, we're learning and understanding that everyone in his kingdom must go through the process to get to the goal. Therefore, everyone has an it to overcome. Amen. Amen. And so listen, um, another uh, version says, so live for what is in heaven. In other words, um, we have this new life. And since we have this new life, uh, we literally are passing through uh, this place where we are. This is, this is a, um, an assignment. It's a, it's a temporary place. It's a holding place so that we can get our assignment done uh, while in this form. But our real home and our real, um, okay, I see you, um, Brother Jerry. Um, our real home and our real connection is um, in heaven. And the realities of heaven would then be um, those things that heaven actually represents. What's in heaven? What do we know about uh, this heaven that we seek, this place where we want to go, this place that once we claim Christ as our savior, we know um, is our heavenly um, home. So let's see, Brother Jerry says, I see this as speaking to sanctification and purification, okay? And so Brother Jerry, I'm gonna need you to come on in um, if you can get in here and, and, and talk to us a little bit about that, expound on that. Because as we begin to look at the realities of heaven, yes, uh, sanctification, purification, yes, uh, what's actually in heaven and the fact that we are connected to that. We are not, we are no longer connected to uh, this world. This world is not our home. And so what we want to do in this new life, now that we've been raised to new life in Christ, is we want our focus to be on our new home and the precepts uh, that govern us because we are connected to this new home, this home called heaven. And so that in and of itself, and knowing that in our true home, Christ is sitting um, at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. When we think about it, when we think on it, um, it should give us, uh, it should encourage us right where we are to uh, stay aligned with on a daily basis, uh, have our prayers lined up with, um, have our desires lined up with, have our speech lined up with, have our walk lined up with the realities of our real home as opposed to um, putting ourselves in places or allowing ourselves to be pulled into places that cause us to trip and, and to slip and to miss um, step along the way, to land up in the potholes of life when 
um, there are some things that we can't avoid simply by remembering who we are and whose we are and keeping our sight where it should be focused. Now we are all we all have an it. We heard uh, Minister Dean say that, and we this is true. We heard Pastor Michelle say it. This is true. We all have an it, but I'm talking about ending up in places that we know don't glorify God, that we know don't connect us to our real home. Amen, somebody. And so as we continue to read through verses two, three, and four, verse two says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. And so as I was reading, I looked at the King James Version and the King James Version says, set your affections on things above. Because we know, listen, we know that um, as we give place to things and we continue to think on things, we begin in this fleshly case to attach our affections to that, our desires, our wants to those things that permeate our minds on a regular basis. And so as we think about the things of heaven, we have to recognize that in thinking about those continuously, then we are setting our affections to things above as opposed to setting our affections on things that are connected on the earth. Verse three says, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden in Christ in with Christ and God. So if we are dead to this life, why then are we still trying to tip back and walk in behaviors, operate with attitudes that frame and glorify and highlight the dead life? Why don't we subscribe to our real life, which is hidden with Christ in God. Amen, somebody? And verse four says, and when Christ, who is your life? And we heard Pastor Michelle uh, highlight that on Sunday. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, but that who is your life? How about if we give, set our affections, on the fact that Christ is our life. If we would do that on a regular and consistent and daily basis, how about those little um, angst that we have? How about those little places where we gravitate to because um, we want to? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, and it's not, um, it's not prescribed in the given test, but we just, it's a place of comfort. It's a place where we have some comfortable memories. And so we gravitate there. But how about if we set our affections on the fact that Christ is our life, then do those behaviors then do those conversations, then do those things that we gravitate to willingly glorify our life because our life is Christ. Amen? Come on, uh, Deacon Camille, are you there? Amen, amen. Yes, ma'am. Come on in. Dick, you gonna go ahead, or you want me? Go, go ahead, uh, Minister Lake Diallo. All right. Come. <clears throat> well, Elder King, I'm I'm thinking about what you're saying about uh, dying, and and then that new life, dying, and then you're living like Christ in a Christ-like life, you know, and and, and how do we li hit live like and in, in our way to heaven, you know, heaven is a place of peace patience, forgiveness. So if we're living like Christ lived, we have to exemplify all the characteristics and traits that Christ did on earth. You have to be kind. You have to be forgiven. You have to be patient to one another. 
and um, all those things, those are us us uh, pulling out our inner natures and fighting what our external natures, our flesh forces us to do. That's suppressing our, our natural things. When somebody does something to offend us, to not make a, a emotional or fleshly reaction to it, to then to take a moment, reflect, and how would how would you know? It's like the uh, the phrase says, "What would Jesus do?" You know, how do we get to that place and suppress those other emotions? And that's really through learning the word and getting this instruction. And then, and then then you have keys and stuff to remind you of how you you have to be taught how to act, you know. And I think that's what we're working to that Christ like and that heaven getting to heaven. Amen. Thank you, Minister Elect. Come on, Deacon Kamel. Yes, ma'am. Um, one thing that Pastor Michelle said on Sunday that really stuck with me. Um, she said, "Look beyond what you can see." And I kept repeating that to myself. Look beyond what you can see. Just think about that thing. How many times do we, we already draw up conclusions or decisions of how something is gonna turn out based on what we see, how we see it? I thought about that thing about how we look through our natural eyes about everything on this earth, about how we see it. What's the outcome gonna look like? But in this verse, here, it says that for we for you died to this life, your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And so I changed my perspective. The perspective changed because I don't go by, I don't make my decisions and I, my thoughts are not lined up by what, by what I see. My thoughts are in God. My trust is in God. My faith is in God. And so we have died to this life on earth. And so everything, it's all about, thinking about the things of heaven. It's all about the preparation of getting to heaven. What are the things we have to do here on earth to be able to deserve to be in heaven? That's how, that's, that's how I create my perspective on what do I need to do here while I'm on this earth to be hidden, to be, be alive and be seen and be an example of Christ on earth so I can deserve to get in the gates and be welcomed into heaven. And so changing my perspective of looking beyond what I can see, putting our trust in God, our faith in God, through our prayer life and through our walking life, even through the valleys of death, everything we go through, let the light shine about who God is in your life. Who are you truly following? And so I looked at it, it's gotta be bigger than just our own power, our own strength. It's gotta be bigger than what we can do. It's gotta be bigger than our degrees. It's gotta be bigger than this stuff that we have on paper of people giving us awards and recognition. It's gotta be bigger than that. Our life has to speak volume of how we truly have sold out to God. How we can show somebody about what it looks like to praise God and worship God and truly carry out our assignment, even when we're going through the same thing someone else is going through. We're no better than anybody else just because you said Christ is first in my life. I will serve him. I will trust in him. We're not exempt from trials and tribulations. So look beyond what you can see. I want people to see through me, Christ. I want people to see that I'm not just living for myself. This is just not me. I'm a living vessel here to, tonight and moving forward that somebody can really follow. Somebody can really have hope through the life I live. And I truly believe when we live that life here on earth, we will make it. We will be there in the heavens to really enjoy eternal life. And one of the things that uh, Pastor went on to say, um, based on uh, what Camille said, was that let the message about Christ and all of its richness fill your life and let it fill it so much that it overflows to counsel others. And that's supporting what uh, Deacon Camille just said, uh, that your Christ like life is so big and so full mm -hmm. that it flows over to others. Amen. Praise God. Um, thank you, Minister Elect Diallo. Thank you, Deacon Kamel. Thank you, Dr. Deans, uh, for ushering us in that place. And as um, you took us from verse three down to verse um, 
16, well, actually verse 12, and then took us to verse 16, but there's a piece of the meat and the potatoes that we actually have to handle because um, we are all right. Listen, we are all right encased in this, um, in this fleshly casing um, as we talk about the prescription of what uh, we need to do. We're, we're pretty good with that. We, we keep those things on the list before us. But somewhere in there, we have to give ear to and we have to give place to those same things that Paul was speaking um, to uh, the Colossians. And so I want to look at verses uh, 5 through 11 because, listen, um, when we give ourselves permission um, to do these things, but overlook those things, then we're running um, a, a, a scary kind of race because we look at ourselves from the inside out. Other people look at us from the outside in. And so the presentation that we give, many times we think um, that we are okay. Many times we think that people see what we see because we're looking on the inside um, as far as, well, I don't do this anymore and I don't do that anymore and I'm better than I was, but um, how close to who we're supposed to be do we really present? Amen, somebody? And so when we look at, listen, verse three says, for you died to this. Um, in the King James Version, um, the scripture says, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Uh, in the New Living Translation, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul found it necessary to deal with the Colossians about their behaviors because there were some behaviors going on amongst them that uh, Paul says should not be named among you. And so when we get um, down to verse five, watch this. If verse three declares that for you died to this life, then verse five ought to be our reality. Uh, verse five says, so put to death, the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Because with Paul was uh, ministering to and he was teaching and he was, he was sending information to uh, this people who uh, basically uh, were a good people. They had a lot that uh, could work for them on the surface. However, there were some underlying things that going on that God could not get glory out of. How can you say um, that you are dead to this life when you're trying to preserve those things that um, massaged your thoughts, those things that um, gave credence, credence to um, you being or feeling satisfied when things weren't going well, you gravitated to these things because they made you feel better. So how can we give ourselves permission, listen, to pick up dead behavior and try to connect it to the life that we now have in Christ? So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with, listen, have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. And so these are the things that people don't like to talk about because these are the things that uh, we can keep hidden. These are the things that we don't talk about in public. We don't want folk to know that, um, that that still has a place in my heart. It still has a place in my behavior. It still has a place um, in, in, in that area that makes me feel good. 
because if it makes us feel good, we don't consider it evil. If it makes us feel good, we don't consider it lusting. If it makes us feel good, we don't consider it immoral or impure. But how about if, listen, let's go back to what the word says. The word says, for you died to this life. And so if all of those behaviors, all of those attitudes, all of those things are things that satisfied us before we were dead to that life. And now that we are dead to that life, we, um, our real life is defined in and is in Christ. How then can we drag those things over to Christ, to this life in Christ? The scripture says, don't be greedy for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. You ever thought about that? That when we are greedy, we are hungry, thirsty for something, willing to give all, do all, uh, commit all to get it. That's greed. And greed has been defined. I didn't define it. It's right in front of us. The word has defined it. As worshiping Amen. Making it a God. A greedy person is an idolater. Worshiping the things of this world. Watch this. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. We don't want to talk about that. We want to claim exception and exemption. Because we look at ourselves from the inside out, divorcing ourselves, watch this, from the things we used to do because we look at the things we used to do as being horrible. But we don't take into consideration the things that we are still faulty of, the things we are still guilty of, the things we still gravitate to under the skies of feel good under the skies of that's not so bad. Under the skies of it's not what I used to do. It's not who I used to be, but okay, I hear you, but what does that look like on Christ? What does that behavior, what does that behavior that you have categorized, that we have categorized, because we all have things we have to work on, that we have categorized as not so bad. What does that look like attached to Christ? Because after all, if we are dead to that life and he is our new life, does that mean that we're dragging him through these behaviors? Hold up, Jesus. I just got to run over here just a second. Just hold up. I'll be right back. Really? The word says, listen. Put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking in you. As I was reading, I went back and forth. I read it in the New Living Translation and I read it in the King James Version and I read it in another version. I said, you, you can't omit what the scripture is saying. Paul was very clear. He didn't bite his tongue. In the King James Version, listen, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. I said, now somebody's going to try to get away with saying, well, what does, I don't know what inordinate means and claim exemption. Here, let me help you. Inordinate means irregular, disorderly, excessive, 
immoderate, not limited to rules prescribed or to the usual boundaries of something. So inordinate affections are unhealthy, listen, unhealthy and obsessive attachments to a person or a thing that manifests through uncontrollable love of it. And an inordinate affection is anything outside of or instead of God that you are willing to suffer for. Amen, somebody? So I still say, Verse three is directly related to verse five. It segues us into verse five. Listen, because if in fact we are dead to this life, listen, then we should not have to be conjoled. We should not have to be monitored. We should not have to be uh preach to. We should not have to have a script given to us to say that if you are dead to this life and you now live a life that's hid in Christ, that these things should not be named among you. The scripture says, this is not Elder King, the scripture says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking in you. I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to all of us. But if we want to be a true picture of Christ, if we want to actually walk in what the scripture says, we want to get to verse 17, because you know, we always want to get to the glory, verses 16 and 17. We want to get to the fa fa finale of it. But there's some things, some prescriptions that we have to pay attention to on our way to getting there. Let me read the rest of it. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now, listen, but now is the time to get rid of anger, to get rid of rage, to get rid of malicious behavior to get rid of slander, to get rid of dirty language. Don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off, listen, your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. How in the name of God can we become like Christ? How can we become like our father if in fact we're dragging him through what's lurking on the inside of us? Those things are supposed to be dead. So in our wokeness, in our awareness, in our uh, making our senses more keen to what we should look like and who we should look like, we can't just give uh, attention to the sweet pieces that talk about us loving one another and supporting one another. Yeah, we need to pay attention to those and we need to operate in those. But we cannot dismiss, listen, that little area that we tend to living in this flesh have buy into. Verse 11 says, in this new life, 
It doesn't matter if you are a Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. When we name the name of Jesus, he lives in all of us. And then verse 12 goes on to talk about how we should live with, love each other, and take care of one another, support one another. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy. Mm. I guess that means no backbiting, huh? Oh, okay. With kindness. No more of that eye for an eye. Okay. With humility. No more piecing out your mind. Because those little pieces that you piece out, you really do need those to live this new life. Gentleness. Treating each other with the tenderness of heart that Christ treats us. Patience. Stop saying, people of God, that you don't have patience. Patience is a test. Every time, listen, I believe that every time we say, I don't have patience, we're given permission to go through a test to earn some to gain some. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So there is nothing that I need to do or nothing that I need uh, to be equipped with in order to do that is not in him. And so I believe a better way to say that is I, I, I'm better than I was. I may not be as patient as I need to be, but I'm better than I was and I'm growing every day. Because when we say I don't have patience, that's a declaration. Doesn't that speak to um, almost saying what God cannot do for you? When you say you don't have it, we speak those things that are not as though they were. We operate in faith. We speak in faith. We recognize that we may be a little short in this department. But if I know this, that if my life is hid in Christ, all I have to do is to declare it. All I have to do is speak to it. All I have to do is to put it on the altar and he will work it out. There's not anything that we could ever need that God will not supply. Does that mean that we'll be skipping on down the yellow brick road everywhere and there are no tests and nothing bothers us? Nobody, the devil, um, it's just, he's just passing us by. Mm -mm. No, you're a hot target. But because of Christ, when those fiery dots come, they go, pew, pew, and they just bounce off. Because we are so grounded and we are so connected that as we go through, our go through becomes a testimony for someone who doesn't think they can make it through. Amen, somebody? And so watch this. Verse 13 says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Now, I know that's not the way we practiced it back in the day. I know that's not the way we learned it in the hood. I got that. 
But the word says, listen, make allowance for each other's faults. So allow people the opportunity to not be perfect. Because last time I checked, watch this. We're not either. Last time I checked. So how then can we fix our thoughts and fix our minds to require something of someone else that we already fall short in? Now, it is true. We may not fall short in that area, but we fall short. And so because we fall short somewhere, can't we extend grace to others and then walk them to a posture that looks better than where they are? Amen, somebody. Thank you, Dr. Deans. We all fall short. I heard Pastor Michelle, I have an it, you have an it, she has an it, he has an it. We all have an it to survive. Amen? Verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Now, I know that's a struggle. Because back in the day, We just go ahead and take our jewelry off and go, go ahead and disrobe, take the heels off, get the job done. And then when we're done, you know, we go ahead and put it back on and go on and walk through. But the Bible says, I hear <laughs> iPad is saying, I got to go back and read this again. iPad is saying, now that's hard for me, but working on it. Thank you for the transparency. That's Sean. That's Sean. Thank you, Sean, yes. for the transparency. Amen. Amen. We are all working on it. And I promise you, it's a struggle. I promise you, it's a challenge. But I also promise you that every time we submit ourselves to God, Every time we invite the Holy Spirit to take over, every time we will win. Dr. Dean says, just continue to work out. Let me, let me read it. Just continue to work on it and press toward improvement. And we already declared last week that press means to add pressure. And so what we do is we add pressure to ourselves. We consider, we keep in the forefront of our thoughts. We keep it up front. I see you, uh, Brother Arkem. It is challenging, but we got this. We keep in the forefront of our thoughts what it is that we're actually striving for, what it is that we actually have our sights on what it is that's actually in heaven. The fact that when we name the name of Jesus, we're just passing through. This here is just temporary. And so if we hold those things in the forefront of our thoughts, it may be challenging, but we'll find out with every opportunity to pass the test. You might fail it the first time, but as you keep those things in the front, forefront of your thoughts, you will make a little better grade on it next time. And then when you have opportunity to pass that test again, you will have make a better grade on it next time. But we have to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable for our thoughts, because our movements are intentional. They're intentional because they're willful. We get to choose. And as soon as we make the decision 
Say, so, okay, I know they didn't just say that to me. Here, let me tell you something. That's a decision. Now, I know that feels good. And back in the day, that would have worked pretty good. But God can't get no glory out of that. And every step of our journey, we have to consider, can God get some glory out of this? Can I attach this to Christ? Does it look good on him? When I peace out my mind, when I lose my mind because you push me to the end of my understanding and I'm just tired of you. What does that look like on Christ? Can heaven recover from that blow up? Because now watch this. You know I teach, right? We can take a group of kids someplace and one child in the group act a fool or steal something. And it's recorded in the name of the school. Now the parent of that child can take them back and the people won't know who they are. But just as soon as the school calls up to bring another group, the name of the school has been affected because of this behavior. Transfer that over. Just as soon as I act a complete fool and we're capable, just as soon as I lay out, stretch you out with my words, heaven takes a hit. They don't call my name first. Heaven takes a hit. My name comes up much later. But initially, somebody say heaven takes a hit. Because the first thing folk are going to say, oh, I thought she was supposed to be saved. I thought he was supposed to be somebody. Oh, okay. All right. Somebody say heaven takes a hit. And so the bottom line is, in every consideration, every opportunity, I don't care if you got to bite your tongue the first few times and feel a little blood. In every opportunity, we have to make sure that God can get some glory. I see you, Sister LaShawn. You need to come on in with that testimony. Let me, let me see if I can pull that back up. A still tongue may say wise head. Let us not rob God of the opportunity to show up in every circumstance. That's good. Somebody write that down. I, um, Elder, I, it's no need for me to interrupt. I, I understand exactly in the where you are. Um, and I think, you know, when I look at this scripture and it, and it almost as if, as if, when you die to Christ, you strip yourself and you know of all things of old. So it's almost like God is saying, here, let me cover you, let me clothe you, let me keep you, let me love you, let me guide you. And I think like even when you look in Old Testament in the Bible, you know, people would uh, when they would introduce themselves, they would speak as like, okay, well, I am this person from this place, from this land, descendant of this person. And so we are descendants of a king. We are descendants. And so for me, this is like just a straight identity check. Why, why are you? Why are you once, um, you know, because everybody comes to Christ. And when you come to Christ, you have your own thing that brought you to Christ. You have your own thing that you maybe went through or that drew you in. You have something where the love was, um, superseded by everything and you know you felt something you've never felt before so when you when we all come to Christ we come with that desire and so it's a good thing to know you know as far as what my identity is concerned and I, I thank God because in the right now God has um you know the Holy Spirit has fallen on me in such a way where it was like let me just give you your identity check in the right quick let me let you know who you are and uh, so to know who you are in Christ can actually uh, keep you 
it can keep your mouth, it can keep, make you keep your, your tongue still. So you can, so God can get the glory. And I can't steal that quote. That is my mother's quote. She always said that to me, a still tongue makes a wise head. She would always say that to me and caution me that you don't have to say something to everything. Um, when you are going through a thing and people will test you because they're going to test you, tests are going to come and it's going to even come more so as soon as you truly die to Christ. But when you do that, um, we don't want to rob God of the opportunity to show up in the places that are most difficult for us. If it's your mouth, if it's your fist, if it's how you handle a thing. Uh, my mother also says you can, uh, you can whoop somebody with that, that pink tornado in your mouth. So you don't always have to fight with your words. Um, th there, there are more ways in how we can cause destruction that does not uplift the kingdom, that does not it rob God of the opportunity to just show up in the circumstance. And so when we forfeit that, what we're doing is we're changing not only our language, but our behaviors as to say, um, it's almost like you're reprogramming yourself. And before you know it, you learn a new response. You learn of, um, to be more tender. You learn to care a bit more. You learn to be forgiving. You learn not to carry the spirit of offense because you don't necessarily know, um, maybe someone didn't craft their words as well. So I don't need to add nothing to what you're doing. This is, this is excellent. Well, this bless is his excellent. name. I, I, I just grabbed something that you said, uh, the spirit of offense. Um, people in, in the, in the day would call it, um, carrying a ship, a chip on your shoulder. And so we have to be mindful. Um, sometimes we walk around, you know, back in the day before Christ BC, um, we would just be mad just because something didn't go right. And it would just be an opportunity for us to be mad. It would be an opportunity for us to get the, the, the pressure off of us by laying somebody out. But now that um, we, our life is hid in Christ, now that he is our life, we ought to seek every opportunity for him to shine, not for us to get the glory, but for him to shine. Because when we think we're getting the glory, we're actually adding shame to the kingdom. Amen. So I love this. And, and, and here we are, um, I'm looking at this and we've run out of time, but I got to read this last little bit and segue into um, this last little piece. Let's see, um, John Bevere, this is something from Pastor Vines, um, has written a book called The Bait of Satan. It talks about offense. Okay, so it's, um, if you struggle with that, write that down. Uh, hopefully that is, some, I haven't read it, uh, but hopefully that is something um, that would feed you, feed your spirit and help you um, as you deal with that particular spirit, because it is a spirit. And because the enemy will try to use it uh, to sift us and to pull us and to cause shame to re be reflected on the kingdom. Real quick, watch this. Verse number 14, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, not the superficial peace, you know, that, that pretend that we have, because we have that ability to pretend that it's all right until we get on the other side of the door or until we get with our sisters or with our brothers. And then we all, we let it all hang out. We, we allow that, that anger that we've been building up, not that fake peace, but the peace, the scripture says, listen, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace 
and always be thankful. Always be thankful. Always be thankful. Because wherever I am on my journey, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning me. It is needful for my growth. It is needful for my process. It is needful for my perfection. It is needful for my testimony, but it is also needful for somebody else who's struggling and doesn't have a clue as to how to make it. Somebody say it's needful. And so if we would just submit ourselves to this life that is hidden in Christ, then verses five through 11 won't be such a struggle. Then verses 12 through 15 will be a delight. And we'll find ourselves ending up with verse 16 and then it will make sense. It's attainable and it makes sense. Verse 16, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. When that message fills our lives, I heard Pastor Michelle say to overflowing, it can't help but overflow because when it fills us on that level, we can't contain it in these finite vessels. And so it's going to fill us to overflowing. Deacon Bruce, you can let me have the screen now. Verse 16 says, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. How would um, that test look on you if instead of fussing and cussing, you just broke out in a praise? You just broke out in a worship. And it's, it's like stumping your toe and, and, and finding yourself still, still caught up in that place and saying something that doesn't glorify God. Where after you grow, if you stump that toe, you say, oh, my God, praise God. Amen. What would um, the unexpected praise that comes out of your mouth say to those who watch your life? Those who need the example of your life as a lifeline for themselves. What would the expected unexpected worship, the unexpected praise, the unexpected speaking in the affirmative to give God glory. What would that do in shaping whose you are and who you are in this new life that's hid in Christ? What would that look like? Amen, somebody? And then verse number 17, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Do it as a representative of the Lord, which means we've got to front load the fact that every movement, Every opportunity is, in fact, an opportunity for God to get the glory. Amen, somebody? Praise God. Praise God. There's so much more. I, 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 had, I, I still got a whole lot. But amen. I believe that as we go through and um, visit the last installment of the series that the Lord is going to give us opportunity to tuck some little nuggets in that we haven't gotten a chance to mention so that it will bring the entire series together and it will bring this to life in us. I don't know about you, but I want to be better. 
I want God to be able to get the glory. I want him to be able to say, well done. I want him to be able to trust me, to send me wherever and to do whatever he assigns me to do. I want my life to speak and to be representative of him. How about you? Amen. Come on, put your hands together on tonight for the time that we've had to share. Bless God, bless God, amen, amen. If you are on this um, feed with us on tonight, amen, praise God. If you're on the feed with us tonight, whether you are um, on live, from Facebook or whether you're in the Zoom. If you don't know this Christ that we are so ecstatic about, I would that you would allow us to usher you to our Savior. We want to present Christ to you on tonight. Just type in the feed, I want to be saved. Type in the feed, I want my life to change. I promise you, if you try him one time, it'll be the peace. You keep going through life. If you don't know him, you keep going through life looking for the missing pieces. If you would just try Christ, he's going to be a piece of the puzzle that fills every crack and crevice that you've been looking for. So if you don't know him, go ahead and type in the feed, I want to be saved. Our deacons, our ministers are watching. Our watch parties, they're watching the comment sections so that we can lift you on tonight. Please keep Betty and Percy Moore, yes, in prayer and the Moore family. Thank you, Jesus. God is a supplier of all need. If you are on with us tonight and you just want prayer, go ahead, just as uh, the Moore family, we have the request for the Moore family, go ahead and put your name in the feed so that we can put your name on heaven's list tonight. We can call you out tonight, amen, and put your name on heaven's list. You don't have to type your situation in. God knows what your situation is. We're just going to lift it to him on tonight. Praise God. Praise God. I'm excited. I'm excited about where we're going. I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm excited about the journey. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Are there any other families um, any other names coming in for prayer on tonight? Those of you who are manning. No Facebook comments. Okay. Okay. All right. Come on. Let's prepare to go to the throne of grace on tonight. God, we thank you. <clears throat> we thank you for all things because you do all things well. We thank you, oh God, because you have oversight over our lives, over our circumstances, over our conditions, over our trials, over our good times and our bad times. We thank you, oh God, for the journey. And we ask in the name of Jesus that you would grant us insight that we will be the better because we have sat at the table, because we have listened because we have heeded your word, because we have pulled the pieces that pertain to us specifically, raked them into us, that we, oh God, will walk better, that we'll talk better, that we'll look better, that we'll represent you better. And so we ask in the name of Jesus that as we leave from this place, that you'll continue to send fresh revelation that you'll continue, oh God, to send fresh understanding, that you'll continue, oh God, to meet us right at the point of our need. And so where, oh God, correction is needed, correct us. 
Where strength is needed, strengthen us. Where growth is needed, grow us. We ask, oh God, that you would do what you know is needed in our lives, that we will be the better because of you. And so we lift the Moore family to you on tonight. We lift the Thomas and the Campbell families to you on tonight. We lift all of the families of Holy and Whole to you on tonight. And we ask in the name of Jesus that you would continue to lean in their direction, in our direction, that you will continue to supply needs, that you will continue, oh God, to heal, to save and to deliver, that you will continue, oh God, to open up uh, the way, that you will continue, oh God, to stop the trick and the trap of the enemy, that you, God, will continue to reign and rule and get the glory. Now we lift you on tonight. We magnify you. We praise you. We give you all of the glory. We count all things done as we lift our prayers in the name of Jesus and the people of God said, amen. Praise God. Praise God. We are happy about you being with us on tonight. We're lifting uh, the Gibsons on tonight. We're lifting Rayetta McGee on tonight. Amen. We're lifting all of you, putting your name on heaven's list. Now, listen, we have prayer teams that pray throughout the day um, at 5 a.m., at 12 noon, and at 8 p.m. And so as we lift your names during the broadcast, either before the prayer, during the prayer, or after the prayer, Note that there's someone grabbing those names as well and taking your concerns, taking your request on to our prayer teams. Amen, somebody. We invite you to come on back on Sunday at 11 a.m. for our morning worship. We trust that you are blessed every time you stop in and worship with us. We invite you, if you have children, to allow them to participate with our youth ministry, which takes place at three on Sundays. If you need that information, contact um, our technician, contact our sister Rinalda, who is the president of our youth ministry and is doing a phenomenal job with them. We ask that if you um, are a friend of Holy and Whole, friend or member, that you would go to the Holy and Whole website and that holyandwhole.org and that you would support the ministry. Amen. This is a great place. I see iPad. This is a great place in space to worship. And it is. It is indeed. We love the Lord over here. We're concerned about what concerns God. And we're concerned about being better. So come join us. Amen. Come on and unmute yourselves, everybody. You know what we do as we prepare to leave. We go forward. 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 Go forward in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 With the love of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. See you Amen. soon. See you on Sunday. Bless God.